technological foundation to really be able to have all the constraints necessary to build adequate robots. Uh, Lisa Borden, Tom Concey, Todd Cowan, Dave Mountain were all part of that original team and uh, made important contributions to the fluid mechanics. Uh, Rainer Vogt, unfortunately now deceased, too young, uh, developed uh, the neurophysiological understanding of the lobster um, nervous system along with Yella Atima. Jennifer Basil, who I still collaborate with, uh, did the basic behavioral work, collaborated with me on the basic behavioral work on lobster behavior, and uh, various students made contributions. Along the road, I met someone named uh, Zoar Pasenek, who became a postdoc in my lab, and he led us into the exploration of levee flights, which I will talk about later in the talk as a model. So um, this is a slide that I've shown for many years. This is sort of the embodiment of the philosophy, the biomedic philosophy that, uh, that we've used. Uh, and I've been thrilled in these talks to hear that instead of being, as, as Tony said, I think it was a little bit overstated to say I was a pioneer, but I did feel like I was a voice in the wilderness for many years arguing uh, for this perspective. And if this, you, I'm actually being redundant in stating this because you've heard this in various forms throughout the talks in this uh, presentation. And the idea that in this, this meeting, and basically the idea is that robot simulations are not uh, adequate to really arrive at an understanding of the animal behavior on their own. And I think of them as a complement to animal experiments and physiological experiments to supply one of the pieces, one of the sets of constraints to validate the mechanisms that we believe are there. And the idea is that, in my, and in particular in my laboratory, it's, it's a laboratory where we house both the animals and the robots under exactly the same roof. And so when we test the animals, we can then test robots that we built to model those animals under exactly the same conditions and use the animal as a yardstick for that, for strong hypothesis testing. And the idea is that the robot uh, simulations and general simulations narrow the field of explanations. And by cycling between, the, and I'll give you examples of this throughout the talk, animal experiments and robot experiments, if this blue background on the slide represents the state space of possible explanations, as we cycle in like this, we're narrowing in on the true behavioral mechanisms of the animal by the process of exclusion. And this is one of the things that in my years of doing biomimetic robotics, I have come to regret in a sense. And that is that very rarely do I arrive at the solution. This mechanism of using robots is a way of excluding possibilities because when the robot manages to reproduce the performance of the animal, you know that you have a valid mechanism, but you don't know for certain that it is the mechanism that's in operation. And where you make progress is when you reject mechanisms because you know explicitly why they fail. Sound good? Yeah. yeah. So this is the idea of strong hypothesis testing, and as Popper told us, we make progress by rejecting things. So the we, we throw up a model, we go as far as we can with it. When it's an adequate explanation, we raise the bar. We say, can it do more? And when it fails in that, we examine why it fails, and we go through this cycle constantly ratcheting up. That's my philosophy. If you take nothing else from this talk than that, I'll be pretty happy because that was my voice in the wilderness mm, 20 years ago. OK, uh, I've kind of said this already, uh, but I'll be very explicit. Let the animal be the yardstick for the evaluation of robot performance. There are really two extremes in people who build biomimetic robots. There are people who want to develop new technologies, and there are people like me who want to not develop new technologies, but to, in fact, uh, understand how the brain works uh, and understand how behavioral mechanisms work. And so if you test the animals, as I said, under the same conditions as you test the robots, then you can judge how good you're doing, how close you are approaching the behavior, the actual explanation for the animal with its behavior, uh, with a quantitative measurement, and that's important. Um, we don't want to take a, to a, a, bot a top, we want, don't want to take a bottom-up approach. We don't want to reproduce all of the biological details simply because they're present. We want to start from a principle, take all of those things that are important to build into the robot that, in fact, embody the theory that we want to test and then find out how those parts work. But we don't just throw things in simply because they're biological. 
And for that reason, my robots don't as closely resemble the robots, uh, the actual animals physically, as they might, right? Uh, and you'll see that when you see my clunky robot lobsters. I was thrilled uh, with, uh, what was the fellow's name? I, uh, uh, the, the salamander talk yesterday? Oh, Esper. Esper, right? Mm -hmm. Esper. In that case, the physical resemblance between the, the salamander and the robot is vital because he's dealing with the locomotion. And, the, and, and in that case, the reproduction of the exact sinusoidal form is important, right? And the swimming looks to your eye very much like the real uh, animal. And that's, that's an important aspect in terms of the appearance, but it's deeper than the appearance because he has those quantitative measurements of the speed of the animal and those sorts of things. And so taking that top-down approach is what we want. And uh, I've already mentioned this, it demands uh, uh, that we have good explanatory power that if we use robots to test, what are we explaining? And can we always explain more with a better model? So now I have to tell you a little bit about uh, chemical distributions in space. You may know about this when I started talking about this, very few people knew, but I heard Paul talking about this in a comment in an earlier talk. Um, <clears throat> a plume is a region of space that contains all the chemicals that were emitted from a particular point source. So this is a, an average of many video frames, about five minutes worth of video taking at 30 frames per second, and the source is here. It's in a flume, which is like a, a wind tunnel for water. The water is flowing in this direction, and what you can see is that uh, there is a defined region of space which contains all of those chemicals. And uh, an animal, like a lobster attempting to find a food source, uh, is capable, when blindfolded, of being able to locate that source by tracking up the plume and arriving there, right? And so that's a sensible sort of things to do. Tuna do this sort of thing. Uh, we know that legendarily sharks do that kind of thing, although it seems a little bit equivocal. Uh, moths do this kind of thing when tracking pheromones. It's been intensely studied. It's a general problem that animals, uh, and, and in fact sometimes humans, participate in to be able to locate sources of things of interest. And I was talking with Bjorn beforehand, and he was talking about the what question, and uh, then there's what I call the where question. Olfaction involves taking in information and being able to decide which combination of chemicals in which proportions are signaling to us what's out there in the world. So a hamburger, right, has a characteristic smell. It's a combination of the various amino acids that are in there that have been singed. A rose has 300 odd uh, basic chemicals that are in exact proportions to give us the perception of the smell of a rose. And olfactory systems are very, very good at producing that, that information in our brain, that construct, that perception, which is just a grouping of the basic chemicals, uh, of the, the constituent chemicals. And when that happens, we can be aroused with the idea that there is an interesting thing out there somewhere to find. And we probably, from prior experience or innate experience, innate uh, drive, know what that thing is. In the case of a pheromone, we know that it's a potential mate. In the case of a hamburger, we've had cultural experience that lets us know that that's a good thing, and there may even be some innate things mixed in there, right? Now, what I'm going to talk about today is not that what question, that is assumed. Instead, there's the hard problem of being able to start somewhere out here where we get that first indication that there is something interesting out there, and we can't see it. I've made this plume be visible for you by putting a dye in there so that it contrasts with the background. And you could imagine that it would be a relatively simple problem to track along here and simply keep smelling until it gets stronger, right? And then I would know I am making progress. That's a mechanism that I'm going to talk about called uh, clinotaxis, right? Take a smell here, take a step in this direction. It got weaker. I was going the wrong way. I better correct my direction. Oh, it's stronger here. Hmm? That's the general idea. And uh, a s the capacity to relate this to space is what we want to get to. So plumes are regions of space that contain complex chemical compounds, uh, complex as many chemical compounds, that are of interest to us because they signal that an item of interest is somewhere in the world. Uh, so in order to find uh, chemical sources, there are these classic approaches that have been discussed by Franklin Gunn back in 1949, and they have a 
had a long influence. One of them is what I said, it's clean out taxes. That means following the concentration gradient with a single sensor. And so if I smell here, well, it's not so strong, but I have it. I smell here, I keep track of that movement. If it's still strong, I persist in moving in this direction. If it gets weaker, I make a change in my direction. And what you get, maybe I should uh, draw it, what you get from that, if you have an average concentration gradient that looks something like this, is paths that are quite complicated, right? Not very straight. Now, Tropa, that's a single sensor, and it's trial and error, and eventually it kind of moves in. And there are more sophisticated forms called, uh, you know, uh, Clino, uh, Clino, uh, oops, ones that combine, uh, cli kinokinesis, which actually vary the speed, and then you get some interesting things happening uh, that have been done in, in many robot studies, like Chris Milhewish and, and uh, Owen uh, Holland. Tropotaxis is where you have two sensors and you're doing a bilateral stereo comparison and you simply steer towards the side of the higher concentration. And that mechanism uh, can actually do a pretty good job of tracking the gradient and you get much more direct paths going in. And that's because if you're balancing the left and the right inputs, then as long as they're balanced, you're going to be moving, you have a good estimate of the gradient, you're going to be moving along the gradient and make your way into the so odor source. Okay. Clear enough, right? Yeah. These are the classic ideas. Uh, following Fra uh, sorry, Franklin Gunn, studies of moths led to another classical way of thinking about chemical tracking, and that is called odor-gated reattex. So you guys all know about that already? But not the students. Cool. OK. So what a moth does. These two methods right here rely only on the chemical information. Odegated reotaxis is one that's a multimodal method, where if the odor is arriving at my sensors, imagine that I'm a moth, because it, it's been demonstrated that moths have exquisite odegated reotaxis. I'm sensing the odor. What do I know? Well, if I'm not in a still room, if there is a wind of any kind, the best direction to go is upstream because the odor, the mass transfer properties of the uh, chemical sensors are going to deliver the odor to me on a path that is continuous, more or less, with the source, however the air happened to move. So if I follow the air current, I'm moving in the right direction. But what do I do if all of a sudden the odor stops? Well, I'm making upwind progress. What the moth has done is a second behavior called casting. I've been arrived, I've been aroused, I know that there's a female of interest out there, and by the way, this method is used by moths in forests to find their way to prospective mates, many, many species of moths. Uh, I know that it's upwind. I don't want to make any, lose any of that ground I gathered in making progress towards her, and it is the male moths that move to the female moths. So I switch side to side, and I cast side to side. Until, as I widen it, I reacquire that chemical stream coming from the source, and then I surge upstream again, switching between the two. Now, all three of these make, oh, and it's very effective, uh, by the way, um, and there's a lot that's known about it, but all three of these make very different predictions about how the animals will move in space. And so the objective standard for our evaluation will be the paths in which the, uh, the animals, uh, the robots, move, right? Um, if the paths of the robot match the paths of the agents, of these, these mechanisms, then, uh, sorry, the paths of robots running these uh, algorithms match those of the animal, then we've got that validation I was talking about. And we don't know whether it's the mechanism, but that's the basis for the comparison, okay? Now, unfortunately, reality is not as tidy as all of that. And I'm gonna show you uh, a video of what an odor plume looks like. Now this is uh, uh, one of those flumes that I told you about, and this is a laser-induced fluorescence uh, image, right? There's flow in this direction, and uh, this is provided to you by Todd Cowan at uh, University of uh, Cornell University, and the color tells you the intensity of the chemical stimulus at each moment in time, and this is a real-time video. Now, normally, 
when we run videos, when we see plumes like this, we don't see them at all. We're not able to visualize them. And what you can see is there's a lot of time here where that pointer is not contacting the, uh, so gaps. yeah, there's huge gaps in there. And if I move it here, even if I'm in there, there's long periods of time where I'm making contact and I'm not making contact. There is no gradient to be able to track. So those biological mechanisms that I just talked about that rely on a gradient, the clinotaxis and the tropotaxis, are going to have a hard time with this. Right? I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the statistics of this, but this is the, uh, the thing you want to keep track of. The problem that animal brains are solving whenever they deal with a turbulent environment is this intermittency of the patches of odor. Right? There's going to be these long periods of time where even though you're in that region of the plume, as defined in that first image I showed you, that's inside of the plume on a time average, you're going to be getting no signal and no guidance. You're not going to be able to estimate a gradient, and you're not going to be able to surge upstream. You're going to cast. So if you place a recording device that records the concentration at one of these locations, concentration on this axis and time on this axis, for a plume that we know that lobsters can track at a distance that we know that they can track it from, 100 centimeters downstream, downstream, not very far, one meter, you can see that there's a great deal of intermittency. And this is the signal that's actually transmitted to the brain of the animal. And sometimes you can have gaps in a plume of up to three minutes. If the animal was sitting there in that plume at that time, three minutes is not the amount of time that an animal will normally spend waiting in, um, in one location. Oh, and uh, the intermittency, oh, I've already said that, okay. Okay. So, it turns out there are many different types of plumes, and I'm going to talk about those. They can be characterized by their Reynolds number and the fluid dynamical regime. One of them is this jet plume, which models the output from a uh, natural food item of a lobster, which is a filter-feeding clam. <laughs> Clam is a filter feeder. It sucks fluid in from the environment, filters out the uh, yummy food particles from it, and then through its siphon, a long, narrow tube, emits a current of fluid out, right, which has been had all the food removed that the clam is interested in. Of course, that fluid has passed through the gut of a clam and therefore smells like a clam to a, to a lobster. And so this, uh, this model, of course, uh, this, uh, this is a good model jet where we can reproduce the exact fluid mechanical regime of the filled out, out current. Now, if I do time averaging, okay, for 20 seconds, now that would mean that the lobster was sitting stationary for 20 seconds, and I were to try to av estimate the average concentration, you can see that that average concentration would depend very much, even just remaining stationary for 20 seconds, on when I happen to sample. Right? So averaging is not going to get you very far. And in fact, at that same position that I showed you before, if we increase the sampling frequency out to 100 seconds, right, you can see that the coefficient of variation, which is the ratio of the variation to the mean, okay, so if you get down around 1, you're getting to some kind of Gaussian distribution, it's taking a very long time to settle down and be manageable. This really, when I did this, you know, we make these measurements, and this really hit me over the head uh, in a big way, that the, the information just isn't there. Think about it. You're going to wait there for 20 seconds, and then you're going to move to that next location, another 20 seconds, and then remember those two, two time points, make a decision about which way to go on these convoluted paths. In a moment, I'm going to show you some video of actual lobster tracking, and you'll see it's nothing like that. So you can look at that structure, and you can wonder if there's information available in those individual pulses of odor. I'll give you an important phrase for thinking about this. Those patches of odor that you see in the uh, video become, from the point of view of a single point sensor, pulses in time. So patches in space become pulses in time. And so here we have a section from one of those videos, and you can look at uh, what information, what kind of features might be extractable by the chemoreceptors on the brain of the American lobster. You could look at the peak concentration, how high the concentration is. 
You can look at the duration of the pulse, pulses at certain, some certain threshold. You can look at the slope of the pulses. Or you can look at the intermittency, right? the interpeak intervals, and try to build up some kinds of statistics to understand what the distribution of those chemicals is like in space. And when you do that sort of thing, you get maps that begin to look like this. So uh, this axis is downstream, this is a cross stream, and the vertical axis is the parameter of interest. So this is uh, the actual peak height, the average peak height over some period of time at that point in space. And uh, this is the initial slope, the rising phase of one of those odor pulses. And this is the actual slope, the rate of change. And what you can see is that they form nice maps that point towards the source. This is zero, zero, it's the source. And you can see that you could do some kind of hill climbing on these extracted parameters. So if the nervous system was doing some kind of uh, feature extraction like this, you would say, well, there is some structure in those features. And uh, what you find is that you get an order of magnitude faster processing from doing this kind of information, working off the individual pulses, than you do than doing the concentration averaging. Still not very fast, but better. Do you have a question? Right. So how do you address that with the variation? So we knew what the integration time of the lobster chemoreceptors were, and we used that, the integration time for the, the averaging interval. So we could use the neurophysiology to guide that. Yeah? But you also think when you open, there's some trade off here, right? So, so the accuracy of this measurement will, will relate to this time constant that you give yourself for integration. Absolutely. Right? So there's no free lunch. That's right. And so what we did was we constrained ourselves to what the biology did. Sure rather than doing a systematic search, although we did do the systematic search as well. Uh, we looked at all the time scales, and it's easy to do. You're right. And there is no free lunch. This is still a hard problem. Uh, so when you do that sort of thing, um, we look at peak height versus concentration. You look at that coefficient of determination. As you do the averaging time, this gets at what you're saying, you can see that by using the peak height, you're getting a much more well-behaved sampling as you increase it. And so, you know, 10 seconds is still longer than the animal uses, but you're getting information a lot faster. And you have this kind of rise in the coefficient of variation here, which is reflecting the fact that uh, you get really get misinformation under 10 seconds uh, if you try to make estimates of simply the concentration there. Yeah, all right, that's a very important set of issues that I'll unpack now. Um, yeah, so this is for that jet plume that I told you about. And the dynamics of different plumes will vary with the fluid mechanical regime. And so we've looked at other ones as well. And you, get, you generally get this improvement as you go to other regimes. So another regime that we looked at was what we called the leaky plume. So if you had, instead of having actively forcing something out of the inside of a clam, you had a bit of decomposing fish lying on the bottom, and currents would entrain that. You don't have any um, momentum being imparted from the source. It's just being passively carried, and you get a different distribution statistic. Um, part of this difference that you see is the result of the action of the fluid medium. As the pulses move downstream, uh, Diffusion, which is a very slow process, tends to make them wider and fatter, and so you get some of that. But they are qualitative and quantitatively different. And um, you know, I'm getting to the all media thing as well. Uh, what you can imagine is that perhaps the lobster's brain and the fish's brain, in fact, have a way of telling which fluid mechanical regime they are in, and then pulling up the appropriate, maybe learned or perhaps inherited statistics for a match to know where they are in the plume. That's a pretty big, especially when you're thinking about clinotaxis and tropotax, that's a pretty advanced mechanism. But that's actually kind of where we're, where we're headed. Now, uh, Paul, would... Something comparable to the lateral line system? I'm sorry? Do, do the lobsters have something like the lateral line system of fish? Because oh, that's a whole other talk. And the answer is yes, and it's probably better. Uh -huh. <laughs> so they could use that for, to, to determine... Absolutely. Uh, they can get the information. Yeah. Um, let me... Uh, did the, well, the other part of, of what Paul uh, said, just because I'm sure Paul knows this, but everybody else may not. Um, 
air and water are fluid media. The principles I'm talking about here, dispersal, will walk, work in air as well. It's just that the viscosity of the air is so much lower that everything happens about 10 times faster. But you can actually get, ooh, I wonder if I have that picture. Well, you can actually get um, the same kinds of statistics by carefully arranging the Reynolds numbers and flow conditions. You can reproduce the siphon current of a clam in the air by matching the Reynolds numbers, and you get the same statistic. But Oh, the Reynolds numbers. Is everybody, you guys, students, probably don't know what Reynolds numbers are. Yeah, you, what's that? Yeah, yeah. So the Reynolds number is a ratio of the uh, dynamic to viscous forces in a flow. Okay? So water tends to stick to itself, and if the water is moving very slowly, and very little force is being applied, then the mass transfer is going to be by diffusion, right? And it gets very hard for things to, uh, to move around. There isn't this active transport. Whereas if there's a force being applied to the media, then you get turbulence. So a Reynolds number of one is the threshold where you've gone to very, very slow moving fluid based on the property of the fluid versus very, very fast moving fluid. And as the Reynolds number goes up, it gets more and more turbulent. The leaky plumes that I talked to you about have Reynolds numbers about 10. Uh, the Reynolds numbers of these are about, um, I think it's about 100 or 200, rel still relatively non-turbulent. And that means that the ratio of the forces of the water holding itself together is about one, one two hundredth of the forces being applied to move the fluid. For a small creature like um, a copepod, a small marine animal, it lives in an environment where there's absolutely no uh, no importance of the fluid flow. They're just carried along by the fluid flow and everything has to do with diffusion to them and they have to work very hard like swimming in molasses as an analogy for us to move through against those forces. Right? So um, that's, that's what we're dealing with there. If we scale up to air, then the air holds together a lot less. There's a lot less bulk modulus. Holds together a lot less and so all of those things happen 10 times faster. For, for less force, you get more air movement, essentially. I lost where I was. <laughs> I take all this, I've been doing this for years, I take all the fluid mechanics stuff for granted. You had a question. Oh, Bjorn, I got it? Yeah, yeah. Thank heavens, okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think I've got you convinced that there is information in the fluid flow. And um, I'm gonna just play for you some audio right now progressively from here, here, and here, so you can get a subjective sense of what it would be like to be a lobster if you were doing the synesthesia sort of thing we talked about yesterday, where you were hearing smells, okay? But remember, this is not the different flavors, this is the concentration, okay? So what I've done is I've taken the concentration sound and I've slowed it down uh, so that you can hear it. We're here. Okay. And now here. Do you hear pitch for intensity? Do you hear the different quality? Another you chance here? You like classical music. I do indeed. <laughs> hear that? That's a visceral sense, right, that the quality of those statistics, and, and our ears are very good at decomposing sound, the quality of those statistics, oh, one more point farther up, is different. There is a different feel for each location. Okay. Do you like classical music, Paul? Never mind. Sure. <laughs> I like many things. Yeah. <laughs> Oops, sorry. I better shut that off. It's pretty annoying, actually. <laughs> I've never gotten used to thinking of it as beautiful, so. All right. Okay. Okay, so, you've got a little introduction to fluid mechanics. This is a lobster, okay, viewed from above under infrared, and the animal's blindfolded so it can't see where it's going. It's got bands on its claws so it can't hurt its human ha handlers. It has two white dots taped on its back so that we can track the path of the animal. 
Um, each one of these squares is uh, 15 centimeters across, to give you some sense of scale. And a flume is a device for producing regular flow. And so the flow is in this direction, and it's laminar and parallel. And what we've done upstream is we've introduced a jet of odor, fish odor, uh, the, uh, clam odor, that uh, is coming out of that jet that sounds, that's just got the same statistical distribution as a, as a clam uh, X current, right? And so you can watch, and unfortunately, I think this video has been sped up so that the animal looks a little comical, so I think slow it down by about a factor of five, but you'll see what the animal's path looks like, assuming that it wants to play. Nope, all right, well, I'll go find the video and play it. Go no, I didn't play. Oh, no, that can't be it. There it is. Okay. It's going to change fields of view for you. And right, right there, he's found his way to the source. Now, if you watch, there's a barrier up there. That's just a bar over the top. It's actually the tube there, and the animal has jumped in on it. Now, you'll see that doesn't look very much like tropotaxis, and it doesn't look very much like the clinotaxis I told you about. It's, in fact, pretty direct. And unfortunately, this copy of the video I had has sped up the animals a bit slower than that. But you get the idea that the paths are very direct. The animal, in spite of all the things I've told you, can solve this problem. Now, previous work had looked at the um, behavior of lobsters by uh, Paul Moore and others. And what they observed in the paths of the lobsters was that as they got closer to the source, the error angle, the angle between their direction of movement and the correct direction decreased. And also, as they got closer to the source, their speed of walking increased. Now, odor-gated reataxis predicts the opposite, that the error angle should increase, because as you're moving straight upstream, moving straight upstream, as you get closer, you're going to have a wider absolute angle. Both of these suggested that the animals were using some kind of uh, information accrued memory, right? Information accrued in the progress of their uh, tracking the plume to get guidance information to Q. And, um, Wait, Frank, you could also argue that the stereo sensing, right, because there's a super low antenna which has the camera sensor. That's so right. So why are you saying memory? Uh, because the rate at which that stereo information converges is still too slow. No, but you haven't shown us that, right? Uh, so you should believe you that, that there's a Yeah, no, no, no. Um, let me think. Yeah, I've only shown you single sensors so far, but we did look at that. And one really? of the, I, I know. I'm going to explain <laughs> it now. Yeah, yeah. So um, what we did was uh, we actually uh, placed, uh, this is no, now a, a fish, but right, but we placed a pair of sensors on the lobster and actually tracked what it was uh, seeing. We also made a map of the plume um, by placing this pair of sensors with a three centimeter separation, which is the separation of the animal sensors. And then we could look at the cross correlations. Uh, between those signals. And we found that there was a kind of map of the cross correlations as you progress towards, but only very, very close to the source. Farther out, the dispersal processes make that information unavailable. Thanks for asking. But, but you would agree that the, the sensitivity of the, the artificial sensor was the orders of magnitude less than what the lobster is having. So we were careful to scale the, the concentration difference. Mm -hmm. we, Whopped up the concentration at the source so that the detection problem was comparable to what the, the animal encountered. What did you use? What kind of sensor? So we were using. Uh, we were using, uh, yeah, we were using dopamine. We were sensing okay. dopamine. So it's quite a sensitive. Uh, so you have a lot of sensors also have a very bad temporal response, right? So this gives you already a, a low pass filtering of your, your signal. Uh, but better than the lobster's. Uh, uh, temporal processing, really? Yeah, no, um, not, these are. Um, 
fine carbon fiber electrodes, mm -hmm. uh, which had better response times for sensing dopamine. You could tune it, it's electrovoltaic cycling. Uh, and I, okay. um, yeah, I have that data. Uh, they collected that data, but uh, that wasn't my project, right? right. But I, I, I rest on that as I think about it. And okay. so we have better temporal resolution for this. The problem with those sensors is that they get poisoned very quickly. But we could get enough recordings to get the data. We were just constantly changing and calibrating sensors. So they were not practical to mount on a robot. But they were perfect for characterizing the plume. Sure. Yeah. Great. Okay, so I guess I've kind of already made this point, but the idea is that the animal has to make decisions about which way to go. And as the animal moves up the plume, each point along its path is a different time where the animal could be garnering information about the statistics of the plume to let it know what kind of plume, something about the source, if its brain can remember it. And so we wanted to be able to test those sorts of ideas. We don't get anywhere near that, but now it's time to, uh, we excluded some hypotheses, but now it's time to talk about the lobster. So here's American lobster, two of them, and I'll just put a little aside here about the lobster because it's kind of gross and kind of amusing. These are two lobsters engaged in a territorial rivalry, and in a moment I'm going to tell you about their lateral antennules in a little more detail. But the animals have long antennae, and these are like parking curb detectors. They're just tactile. They don't have chemical sensors on them that work at a distance. They have some chemical sensors, but primarily they're used to feel their way around. They're quite long. If you look here, it's kind of hard to see. The next slide will show it better. There's a little antennule, this is the antenna, this is the antennule, and there's two of them, it's a biramus structure. Uh, there's one on each side, so there are four of these antennules, the medial and the lateral on a single stalk, flick, and this thing right here is an amazing lobster nose. As a matter of fact, it'll probably get easier if I show you the picture on the next slide up close, okay? There's that branch structure here, the lateral and the medial antennule. Uh, the lateral antenna was pointed out of the plane of the screen here, and then the medial antenna. And this surface right here has 250,000 primary chemoreceptors arrayed along the length. It also has a comparable but smaller number of flow sensors built onto it. So this is the animal's nose. And um, Yella Atima, who I worked with in Woods Hole, did this study where he looked at memory in these animals, social memory in these animals. Um, these animals have a very good olfactory sense. These animals are fighting with one another, and they, turns out, can remember individuals. If you fight them, as he and Thomas Breithaupt did many times, the intensity of the fight goes down on repeated, uh, on repeated trials, with the loser continuing to lose. And there's a lot we can talk about about that. But basically, the animal's nephropores, somebody have a question? Animal's nephropores are located right here. They emit urine, right, in a jet from their faces, right, from right from their front edges. And uh, this is the perfect signal for one of these animals, which has an exquisite signal, to be able to identify the individual, that decomposition of the chemical signal. So they're, in fact, pointed and arranged in this way to be able to spray their individual body odor towards one another directly onto the surface, as you can see right here, is those lateral antennules. It's a very salient stimulus that could be associated, which they haven't demonstrated, with the prowess of, a, of an opponent. Out of curiosity, what are they fighting about? Do they want to maintain their own territory? Exactly. And how big are these territories they maintain? Very important for what we'll talk about in a little bit. So, Field work with marine animals is naturally complicated. Um, but typically, what these animals do, and it extends to just about all of the decapod crustacea except crabs, uh, is that they have a particular shelter that suits them well. They defend that shelter, and every night they're nocturnal. They go out and they patrol a boundary, and then they meet other lobsters at the edges and maintain those boundaries. Right? Uh, they also tend to investigate new objects that have appeared in that environment. So you put a new rock down in an area or an anchor or something, and they spend a lot of time investigating those things. It suggests that they have some kind of an understanding of what their environment should look like. And uh, so, so what, what's the dimension of these territories? Sure. It's about 50 meters with overlap. And um, 
that, yeah, and they, they overlap, and so you don't have one lobster every 50 meters. They can be quite, quite more dense than that. But what they fight over are the shelters themselves, and um, that's a very small sort of territory, and they'll also fight for access to mates, of course. And if you happen to put two of them into a boxing tank like this, this is about uh, a meter by a meter square tank with those lobsters, you've got them in such close physical proximity that they just fight readily. Okay, so the chemical sensing apparatus of the lobsters, um, there are the dactyls, okay, which are the feet. And if you ever look at a lobster's foot the next time you're eating one, right, you'll look and you'll see they're covered with many fine hairs. Those are mechanosensory vibrissi, but they all, uh, hairs, but they also are um, many chemosensory. So as the animal walks along, it's actually tasting the substrate. The antennae I've already told you about, the medial antennules, we don't know what their function is, but they are not carrying very many chemoreceptors. It's the lateral antennules that combine all those primary chemoreceptors and flow sensors. They also engage, if you ever watch a lobster in a tank, called something called flicking behavior. The antennules will come down independently, like this. And what's happening is the facing surface with all those chemoreceptors on it is being forced through the water. What you're doing is you're raising the Reynolds number by flicking it and therefore giving chemicals better access. Right? And we look at this very closely. A, a stationary animal tends to flick quite a bit. There's a lot about that in the literature. However, yeah? Equivalent to flicking? Yes, it's, the analogy has been made. Yeah. So when humans sniff like this, we're forcing more fluid into our nares. It gets better access to the chemoreceptors, and we become more sensitive, right? Because it's basically the physics of, of chemical access. The important thing about the flicking is that it doesn't appear to be something that happens during chemical tracking. During chemical tracking, we looked at this. We painted the surfaces of the antennules with a um, glow-in-the-dark paint and then we were able to look at their angles. The animals tend to hold them in a fixed position uh, while they're tracking, maybe giving a frame of reference. Again, it probably comes down to Reynolds numbers. They're walking into the flow, they have them elevated at a particular angle so the oncoming fluid strikes them, right? And they're getting that kind of information out. That flicking is almost never seen during the tracking that we've done. 70% of the lobster's brain is devoted to olfaction. So those lateral antennules project in to these structures here, which are called the olfactory lobes. Right. The accessory lobes receive no primary sensory input. Look at that, it's a big, big structure, uh, but receive information from the uh, chemo sensors. And down here, there are antennule interopil, which receive inputs on flow from the, uh, the base here and also from the, uh, the antennae. That information comes in here. Now, this is a higher order processing center. The divisions of the, of the crustacean brain are the protocerebrum, roughly here, the deutocerebrum, and not surprisingly, the tritocerebrum. The principle here is that there's one principal neuropil for every one of those appendages that's out there in each one of the modalities uh, out there in the brain. So olfaction here, primary tactile chemoreception here, is David Sandeman's elegant uh, drawing of the organization of the, of the, the brain in a nice diagram as opposed to one of these histological cross sections. Um, a diagram here, and what you can see is that there's a left and a right side of the brain, a lot of primary sensory input, say from the eyes here in the protocerebrum, from the antennules here, from the carapace here, uh, bilateral. And there are very few places where the information gets merged on both sides. And typically, right. yeah. They are indeed, and the separate sensory streams go to different neuropils. They're, they're separated by, by submodalities. And, and I really don't want to go into it, but if you look at the uh, antennule in close detail, there are seven different types of receptors there. Uh, and we divide them coarsely into chemo and mechanosensory sensors. Yeah. Uh, so, the point that I'm making is that if we're going to be making left-right comparisons, there has to be a place where information processing is taking place, where the two sides are coming together. And the candidate for that is a structure up here called the central body, sometimes in insects. It's a hemiellipsoid body. Um, one of those midline structures here 
is a likely candidate for the fusion, but there's a heck of a lot of information processing that's being carried out on both sides before it converges here, or at least a lot of brain real estate that's being devoted to processing there. And these are the parts that send connectives down to the thoracic ganglia, which is another structure which controls the leg movements and the walking and this bi-directional communication there. So there's a lot of processing of that primary sensory information for constructing things. There's a case to be made in terms of the neuroanatomy for the possibility that the kinds of sophisticated processing I've suggested earlier could be happening in this, in this brain. It's wired the right way. And then some simple guidance decisions are made centrally. Um, the brain is doing a lot more than olfaction, uh, as we know, in these animals. There's the input from the eyes and so forth. I don't want to go too far with that, but to point out that about 70% of the brain is devoted to olfaction tells you how important this is for the animals. What about the volume of the lobster brain? Hmm. Well, lobster brain is about that big. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it's less than a cubic, maybe half a cubic centimeter. That's a right. ballpark estimate. Um, but there are a very large number of small neurons in here. You mean many, many small. I mean, 10 to the, 10 to the, uh, 10 to the fifth neurons. Uh, now, when it's comparable to, let's say, a bee brain, it's maybe twice as large as a bee brain. It's much, 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 yeah, much bigger than a bee brain. Yep. Yeah. Because the bee is about a cubic millimeter, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's much larger. You can hold one in your hand. You can have it in a jar and look at it and actually tell you different. Eat it. You can eat it. I've <laughs> never <laughs> eaten. I don't think I've ever eaten a lobster brain, actually. Really? There, that's, it's, You're disappointed. Uh, <laughs> It's too small. I guess the Romans used to take the, the tongues of larks out and cook them up in a big mass, but it's just too much work to go in there and get all those brains out. Uh, and I guess the Romans had slaves for that. <laughs> um, I've lost my place again. <laughs> yes, yeah. Aaron? Yeah. yeah, that's a deeply interesting discussion to have because it goes in many directions. Mm -hmm. and, and you're exactly right. I, I hope what I have done so far is impressed you with the problem that the animal faces mm -hmm. and that it has some hardware that might be able to deal with it. Right? Right. Okay, now maybe we'll move to software. Okay, so the problem that we set up for ourselves was to take those patches and uh, pulses in time that represent the patches in space in a sequence look at how they're processed to be able to produce the paths of animals in space. So here's a path of a, of a lobster. Uh, here's the odor source. There's the flow. It's the same sort of thing I showed you before, these very straight paths within the plume. That's the problem. What is happening in between the sensors and the effectors to produce that? And so we built this, uh, all the other biology and so forth I told you in place. We built this first biomimetic uh, robot with um, the help of the MIT AUV lab, was a prototype robot. And um, the points of biomimetic scaling, as I like to call them, those are those key points that we needed to test the theory. And what we set about doing was testing first the idea that tropotaxis could explain the animal's uh, behavior. And so for that, we built the robot about the size of the lobsters that were running, total length, 24 centimeters. We, the robot was capable of moving faster than the lobster but we made sure that we slowed it down so that its behavior matched the walking tracking speed of a lobster, right, nine centimeters per second. Um, the height off the substrate at which the animal held its antennules was matched, as well as the intersensor separation of three centimeters. So we're sampling this plane off of the substrate at a fixed separation of three centimeters, which corresponds with one of these lobsters. And we knew from the neurophysiology how quickly information came into the sensors, and so we matched, even though our sensors were faster, we matched the temporal rate of information flow coming in. And what we simply did was we built what you would call a Breitenberg machine, where we just uh, connected the left sensor to slow down the right motor proportionally, and the right sensor to slow down the left motor proportionally. That's an implementation of simple, pure tropotaxis. Now what we can do is we can place that robot under exactly the same conditions as we tested the animal in our flume and 
observe the behavior to see what it tells us. What sensor do you use there? Ah, important question. Um, for the first robot, we didn't have a lot of money. And so uh, uh, Joe, Ayers, Joe Ayers, who will be here on Monday, is that right? Uh, called this a can on wheels, right? And Joe, <laughs> Joe built, uh, builds really elegant biomorphic, neuromorphic robots with legs that walk around and so forth. Because he was interested in motor control and locomotion. Uh, and we were interested in what does the brain do with the sensory information? We made sure that the motors were competent to reproduce the animal behavior. So this first set of sensors on the first robot, we use a series of sensors, is simply a conductivity sensor. Okay? So what we did was we ran the first the robots in a flume which had fresh water in it, and we put a plume of salt water out there to be able to get exactly the same Reynolds number. Okay? Um, and I, I mean, you're anticipating something I was going to say later, so I'll say it now since you asked. Um, the problem with making salt concentration is that the plume will sink. So we developed this whole approach of adding ethanol, right? Ethanol is infinitely uh, soluble in water, and it made that plume buoyant, and we titrated it so that we had a perfectly buoyant plume that had salt in it that the sensors could Sorry. sense. Uh. <sighs> Uh, yeah, but we, 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 never mind. <laughs> I don't, how much time do I have left? Another two hours? Half an hour? I don't know where I am. <laughs> but I'll know how to speed up as we get along, because I am going more, I think I'm, I'm making it accessible to everybody, but uh, I am going more slowly than, than maybe I could, so. I'll go much faster, okay. Uh, so, let's take a look. All right. We have. Oh. Got it. I'll keep my eye on the clock. You want me to stop at t when the, the big hand's on the 10, right? Okay. But the sampling rate, how much do you sample? Oh, it's uh, 2.5 hertz. Uh, we're taking one measurement of the concentration, averaged over two points. So the the, 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 we've got a kilohertz sensor. And we average over the 2.5 because that matches what the neurophysiology told us the lobster does. Okay. So for the experiments, we controlled the amount of time for each trial. We gave the robot one and a half times the amount of time it would take a lobster to do the same task. Um, we had the statistically characterized plume I've already showed you. And we used a plume that uh, we knew the lobsters could track. Uh, we varied the distance of the, the robot from the source, its starting orientation, whether it was pointed towards the source, and we varied the algorithm, as I'll tell you. Okay, I'll come back to these in a little bit. Well, actually, I could, this is probably an easy place to start. This is the control structure for the first algorithm. Um, this is what's called a FSA, a finite state acceptor diagram. Basically, each one of these nodes is a behavior. And this is basically tropotaxis. That's that Bradenburg machine, steer to the side of the higher concentration. So a transition from start to tropotaxis occurs when we tell it to start. So the sensory signal of start says go from being stationary to do tropotaxis. When time is up, you go to stop, and the ro robot stops at 1.5 times it takes, it takes the lobster to do the task. Otherwise, continually loop and do tropotaxis. Okay? I'll tell you about this in a minute where we add other behaviors in there. But this formalism is basically behavior-based robotics where you transition between behavior states based on the sensory context. And for our analysis, we measured, starting here, we measured how far it got, the closest approach to the source within the available time. Uh, we measured the time it took to the, guess, the closest approach, the path length to get to the source. So when it arrived at the source, we're measuring how direct the path was. We measured path torturosity. Well, how wavy the, the path was, and we also measured uh, the number of hits, and we produced this overall performance index, which was success combined with directness. Success being the number of times it actually arrived at the source. So here is pure tropotaxis. So there's the robot in the flume, there's our chemical jet, and this is one of many, many trials, actually two trials, I think. And again, the videos are not cooperating. I don't know why it worked in the hotel room.
Here we go. When the light comes on, we've gone into start. And you can see that the robot moves directly towards the source. And you see this kind of graceful counter turning. Right? Well, you say, well, it was pointed directly at the source. We varied the starting orientation. Light comes on. The agent steers in. And it finds its way once again through that graceful counter turning there into the source. Now, I think this is a replay of the first one. Yeah. But. So you use stereo sensing as well? That's right. This is pure tropotaxis. The separation between the sensors is the same as the lobster, same height off the substrate as the lobster. So we're moving the sensors through space in exactly so the. If you use, you use the stereo information That's right. for your decisions. That's right. So it's, a, it's literally a brain bird machine. Um, this algorithm was not very effective. I showed you good trials there. But what m was missing from this video is if both sensors exit the plume at the same time, then it doesn't know what to do. You started in the plume, there's no problem with it making progress. But many, many of the trials, many of those turns led to the agent steering out of the plume. And so we did a second algorithm. And I want you to, uh, which uh, simply included a backup instruction, which made sense. If it lost the plume and it had been, it would simply back up. But uh, just watch, the light comes on and the robot moves gracefully and directly into the, uh, into the plume. Now watch this backup instruction. Same conditions. Okay? The light will come on and you'll notice a difference in the robot performance. Same plume. It's no longer that self-confident robot. You've got these kind of meaningless turns and jerks being included in there, right? Now it gets into this thing, this region here we call the proximal jet, and you get that graceful counter turning. Right? This is telling us something that it was a big revelation when we found it, and not a big deal to fluid mechanicians, that the environment that the uh, robot is moving in has these two different regimes. What we call the distal patch field, where the fluid mechanical regime made the tracking difficult, and uh, the distal, uh, the proximal jet, where the contrast, essentially, between the edges of the plume made it possible for tropotaxis to work. So, um, this is one of those important lessons from building a robot. We learned something about the interaction of the robot with the environment that if we'd done a lot of math and had a lot of accurate models might have popped out for us, but it was a very easy demonstration to say, huh, why does that happen? What is that telling us about the problem? Yeah. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the various fluid mechanical regimes that we've looked at. We've looked at a variety of them, but we have never made, used a wave tank, for example. People have looked at that, um, but we've not done that in part because the apparatus is difficult. If you move your hand to make waves, you don't have a reproducible set of conditions. If you go with a wave tank, um, yeah, but yeah, the fluid, you're just saying what we said before, the fluid mechanical regime is important. And here, Right? We know that the lobster can track this plume. It's a biologically relevant one. So we're making progress that way. But we would like to see the rest of the world, for sure. I have a question. So mm -hmm. um, in insects, you have this, this stereotypic cast and search behavior. If you lose mm -hmm. the plume, you start to cast across the floor until you hit it again. Yep. So what do the lobsters actually really do? Do they also display cast and search? No. That example that I showed you, the video is very representative. That's why we, we wanted to look at these animals. The, uh, the casting behavior of moths is really dramatic and obvious. Yeah, exactly. Up, upstream, crosswind, I thought about putting a video of it in here. Lobsters just don't do that. Really? They just don't do that. And that was a behavioral indication that this is worth pursuing. Uh, although I have to be careful and say we haven't observed lobsters under all conditions, mm -hmm. but under conditions that match the ones that the moth does, mm -hmm. we haven't seen them do casting. Now I'm about to kind of go back on that a little bit because what we do next relates to it. Okay, here's some results, okay? Actual summary paths, and I won't give you all of the summary statistics, but uh, we have an experiment where you use that simple tropotaxis algorithm. This is starting uh, close to the source, right? Starting far from the source. This is a chemo, a positive chemotaxis robot. It's attracted to the source. 
If you reverse the sensors, it's repelled from the source. Okay, see that? And you can eyeball this now and see that out of the 12 trials here, we had only one that showed that graceful counterturning and looked like it was going to make its way to the source. Most of the rest of the time, it lost the plume. See? Which is what I told you verbally before. This is not what animals are doing, right? Not what the lobster is doing. It's not an effective algorithm. We can reject it. But we can learn something more. When we started even farther out here, um, you can see that it's just wandering. There is no structure for guidance anywhere down here in what we call the distal patch field. There's just no structure. The only time we get any success here is when we actually get, by chance, into that proximal jet, which makes sense in terms of the mechanism. And this tells you, of course, that the animal, the robot, is repelled from that proximal jet, that there is structure there to be got. It isn't just chance. Okay? So you can ask and answer those questions about these plumes. Now, if we look at the backup instruction, okay, the second algorithm where out of the plume you back up, you get an increment in success. Okay? And what you see is, you know, you start and you've got about three trials that actually make it in here. Some of them overshoot for various reasons, which we can talk about. Um, but what you also see is all of this back and forth. And that is those backup instructions where it's basically tracing out the edge of the plume. A lot of random behavior here, not as dense there. Repulsion here, repulsion, uh, sort of random walking there. It's emphasizing the fact that the fluid mechanical regime is actually reflected in what the robot does. That the, there's two perceptual categories that actually exist for the robot here. Now, uh, look at this one successful trial here. I think it was just, just chance, right? One chance in 12 that it actually got in there. Um, I will suppress the comment about uh, technology-driven roboticists making a lot about a single success. Uh, but uh, you might say, well, this isn't a very good uh, explanation because, well, we could increase the intersensor separation and uh, maybe there would be a gradient to track down in the distal patch field. Well, with our robot, it was possible to do that. And so we can go with the intersensor separation of the American lobster of three centimeters. We can make it narrower to one centimeter and look at essentially what it means to get two sensors to double your concentration detection but have no spatial separation. Five centimeters or seven centimeters. And what you can see is that indeed you do get an improvement in performance as you increase the intersensor separation. Yeah. However, these are all starting very close to the source. If you push it out into the distal patch field, you get random wandering by the agent. There's no structure out there at all, no matter how much, even when you go to physiologically unrealistic uh, distances. So you suggested that the hammer, hammer head shards with those wide and it has actually uh, olfactory receptors out there. Uh, it's, it's, no, it's an Aries or out there on the, on yes. the huge thing. It's been suggested that that's a sensor separation yes. device. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and it may be, but the evidence, the behavioral it's evidence. Not, it hasn't been looked at very carefully. The people that have looked at it haven't found behavioral evidence that goes along with it. It may be that it just doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, I don't, don't want to go too far there because I've got, what, seven minutes left and 90 more slides. Okay. <laughs> so um, I got very excited about the comparative approach here because I saw that um, <clears throat> across the spiny lobsters as opposed to the clawed lobsters, the lateral antennules showed a great range in size. And I thought that perhaps uh, there would be, this is the evolutionary road that was taken by, uh, by the animals, that these animals might be, in fact, dealing with, uh, with those gradients. And in fact, Panularis interruptus lives in the intertidal zone, which is a, a region where you have a lot of vigorous turbulence. So the turbulence, in fact, is something that's uh, leading to shorter, well, maybe correlated with shorter antennules. And these animals here tend to live in beautiful kind of calm tropical reef regions, and that inner sensor separation, while large, is uh, uh, not matched to turbulence. They live in a relatively calm environment, and they're kind of shy animals that don't go out when there is current, for all that we know about their ecology. Uh, but even with these animals, uh, these antennules aren't capable of being stiff and holding position. In fact, they kind of flop around when they get that long. So they could have put some chitin in there, but presumably the uh, these floppy antennules serve some other function rather than source localization. So it seems as though what the brain of the lobster might be doing 
is, uh, is working on the hard problem of being farther out, looking at the temporal information rather than uh, looking at uh, you know, the intersensor separation, the coincidence, using some of that memory that we talked about. But American lobsters who are very good at the chemical tracking, and by the way, we haven't studied, nobody has really studied chemical that, tracking. I don't understand the argument. Okay, because sorry. Why, why do you not infer from this that there's a temporal processing that matters? Because I'm not, I'm only suggesting that it's consistent. I'm, I'm not why making it. Why would that be consistent? Because the, the key feature of this issue is that you have just a larger region you can now cover with your, with your chemosensory right. system, right? And then, indeed, the floppiness will vary, so the flicking they can perform with these different morphologies will vary, yeah. that's one relationship. Yeah. So how from there should I come to the conclusion that it's not the spatial organization of the receptors, but some form of temporal processing? Um, I'm not actually going to conclude that so much as, as, as make it a, a, an additional hypothesis, oh, okay. right? Right. Yeah, that's fine. It's, suggest it's suggested in that direction. I'm not trying to conclude it because there's a few other pieces that need to be in place to right. do that. Okay. But if we look at the accumulation of, of these, these um, the evidence, like the, the nature of plumes becoming more di di uh, dispersed and intermittent as they get farther from the source, that hard problem is one that you need some other information, source of information separate from the interspatial separation thing that you'll get in order to solve. And so you look at the animals that have the larger intersensor separation and they don't have that rigid fixed position, which means that in order to make use of it, they also have to keep track of the positions of their antennules as they move them. And that makes it, uh, it's kind of like an unfixated eye. Okay, so those are the instruct, that's the, uh, the, the algorithms that I told you about. And um, basically the backup instruction just says if there's no signal present, back up until you hit it. If there is, steer, and that's the, the FSA diagram. I'm going to show you more of them, so I want to make sure that you just understand what this, this diagram shows. Okay, so um, steer towards higher concentration, pure tropotaxis back up, and both of these things go to timeout at a period of time which is our arbitrarily set trial so we can make comparisons across trial. Fixed amount of time, one and a half times the amount of time that the lobster would take. So those are algorithms one and two, tropotaxis and augmented tropotaxis. And we built Robo Lobster 2, better, sleeker design. Um, and we got up uh, and free from salt we built our own uh, fluorescence sensors, which had real-time dynamics and could sense fluorescein, which could be neutrally buoyant solutions. And we added a foot-like sensor there on the bottom, sensing the substrate to be able to know when it had arrived at the odor source. We added an onboard gyro so that we could fake a flow sense. We have a little port here uh, with the idea of being able to include a flow sensor, which we never were able to build. Uh, but basically, uh, we have this new robot, which is uh, better performing in this lovely new flume. And um, what we explored was odor-gated rheotaxis. So the idea, as I think we've all got it right now, is that as long as you're encountering patches of odors, it gives you a way to leap across those patches by surging upstream. Some period of time out of contact with the patches means that you cast until you reacquire and hopefully find your way in. We can evaluate the performance of this algorithm, right, by placing a robot this robot uh, into the flume, tracking various chemical plumes. And we went here to look at these um, leaky plumes, as I said. I'll tell you more about that. Now, here's our FSA diagram, OK? Start, upstream surge, as long as the sensors, either one of the sensors, are detecting the odor. So we know which direction is upstream from the gyroscope or flow sensor. and uh, continue moving upstream until you have no odor. And then you either cast left or cast right. And this variation is where we begin to put some memory into the system. So there are uh, some possibilities. We could have just a random choice of left and right. We could remember which side had more stimulation and make our casts preferentially towards the side that had been more concentrated. Mm -hmm. Um, so what we did on this, these are the nine algorithms that we contrasted. We had a single sensor, a dual sensor, which did a simple sum, and a dual sensor with memory 
for which side had been stimulated more or less. We can also do what we call discrete sampling, where we stay at one point and sample for a period of time and make a decision about where to move. Or we could do everything continuously. Or we could do what we call the hybrid is whenever you lose the chemicals, you pause. Whenever you lost, lose contact with the plume, you pause and wait for a little while to estimate whether or not you're in the right place. And if you remember that video of the lobster tracking, you saw it occasionally pausing, right? So that seemed like it was kind of a, a reasonable sort of thing to just to move continuously, right? So we have these nine, uh, nine different algorithms. And the idea is that it ends up doing, well, we'll see what happens. Okay? And um, this is kind of a, a summary of that. Let me see if I have the, the video. Yeah. Okay, I, hope, I bet this is not going to play. Yep. I don't know what happened to them, but. Uh, all right, I'll come back to it. Please, stop the experiments and jokes, huh? Um, in what way? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I got to go to Cornell. So uh, I guess I'm getting I'm low on time now. So uh, we got to go to Cornell. Uh, we got to go to Georgia Tech. We got to go to Friday Harbor to get different fluid mechanical regimes. And since I see that I'm out of time, uh, <laughs> and we did go to the Red Sea, I'll give you the short, the short answer here. Looking at those different algorithms, the best thing was this the best perform oh, sorry, this is a performance index, which compounds the number of times there was success in arriving at the source per trial and multiplies that by the directness of the path. So one is perfect performance, and zero is really bad performance. So in the first set of experiments I showed you, here's lobster performance, very, very high. Okay? Here's the pure tropotaxis, terrible, augmented tropotaxis progressively better, but still nowhere near where the lobster is. Also, probably not very biological with that backup instruction. Right? Tropotaxis is dead. These were done on a different plume, that leaky plume, a different fluid mechanical regime. And you can see that the lobster also finds that a harder task. His overall performance index in terms of path tortuosity and success is lower. And if we deal with the discrete uh, uh, single sensor, the discrete double sensor, and the discrete double sensor with memory, you see that we're approaching the lobster, we're getting better, but there's still a gap. So we've got some pieces, we know some things that are working better, but we still have a ways to go, okay? And we can also see some variation in the, in the robot's performance. We have looked, to get at your question, I don't know your name with the apple, but to get at your question, we did look at a flume uh, which had a plume which meandered, which had produced a countercurrent meandering, which produced a predictable and reliable alternation. The algorithms performed comparably, slight degradation, but very well at that, this bit of memory that's included in there. Made all the difference in the world with that persistence, because it's like a longer term average of the average structure of the plume for making those casting decisions. Okay? And then we did go to the Red Sea, and this is that final sort of validation test. Um, we took the robot, which was really built to work in a laboratory tank, okay? It was designed to work in a laboratory tank, but I got the opportunity to go to the Red Sea. And the nice thing about this place was that while it was a real world current, the currents were known and predictable and measured at the marine station regularly, so we could know what the flow velocity was and how it had been characterized to be able to think about those things. And so um, this is one video, and the uh, one video of that performance, we did a whole series of experiments. Um, and the important thing that, you, that you'll see here is that the uh, odor-gated reattaxis algorithm, in fact, did work rather well to get the uh, agent to the source. Uh, and overall, it wasn't as good as what the lobster would do. Bear in mind, we don't have lobster performance data here. But the really interesting thing is when we got out there in real flows, the algorithms that worked in the laboratory didn't fall apart. This is not, there's a lot of difficulty in interpreting these results, but it is a wonderful bit of validity. So you see it's beginning to do its surge now. It's found the plume. To you and I, it looks like there's quite a lot of chemical there, but in fact, there are plenty of those patches, as I showed you. And the casting brings the thing in, and it, in fact, digs its way in and then stays there. And eventually, that downward sensor will signal, you can't see that here, but will signal that it, in fact, has arrived at the source. Okay, so I'm at the limit of my time, and I am sorry for being slow, but hopefully I've been clear.
I won't tell you about any of this interesting stuff with levy flights. I know. <laughs> well, I'll be happy to talk to anybody about it. Um, and you can't really talk next week. That's right. Well, <laughs> I've got the octopus. This is the sensory motor side, right? The octopus <laughs> manipulation side is the stuff I'm going to talk about next week, right? So, um, a general summary. Um, I started out this talk telling you that, of course, we've done a great job of rejecting hypotheses. <laughs> <laughs> and we've done that, and we've learned a lot from that, but we honestly still don't know how the lobster is doing what it does. And we know that because of this biomimetic approach we've taken where we're using the animal as a yardstick on the same task. Um, that's the power of the technique. And I guess I could put that up, but basically that's the take home message, and <laughs> thanks very much. Mr. Aaron? <laughs> I really <laughs> talked too long, didn't I? <laughs> Which ah. have to do with the fact that there are many different sub-problems that some are posed by the differences between environments, some are posed by differences in the available mechanisms that have already been produced by previous designs, both physical mechanisms and information processing mechanisms, and those differences, internal, external, and of course, as the predators and bay involved in the information processing of other organisms, change the space of possible solutions, uh, of problems and possible solutions. And I believe that when we try to talk about how to design a robot, and then we describe it in terms of human terms like uh, intelligence, language understanding, learning, emotion, we are totally ignoring a huge iceberg of complexity with discontinuities in problems and solutions. And if we do that without doing this kind of detailed analysis, we will continue floundering, as I think robotics has done for the last 20 years, and not really making significant progress, or more than making significant progress. Right. So I think people really must learn from this that there are many, many sub-problems, and you have to devise conceptual uh, frameworks for thinking about the options, both the, 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 the <coughs> options in problems that can arise and options in terms of solution spaces instead of assuming all the language gives you the goals to the formula. Yeah, okay. I, thank you very much. I think I, I mean I completely agree with, with what, what you said. And and part of the beginning of what you said is something that's an implicit undercurrent that Tony in my work that Tony mentioned in his introduction that I didn't get to get to, and that is evolution. Uh, the inherited mechanisms that we talk about are the starting point for any mechanisms that emerge and um, in, in, in an existing organism. And so that selection process is important. In addition to the Umwelt sense that you're kind of getting at, taking the lobster's perspective and not assuming they're solving a human problem, but solving a lobster's problem. Yeah, I completely resonate with what you said. All of the animal uh, behavior studies that we've done have deliberately been done with the animals blindfolded. So we've excluded vision from it as a way of simplifying the problem. Um, there are no good studies of the interaction of these senses and what they contribute. I can tell you that when the lobster arrives at that clam, he doesn't, she doesn't need its eyes to be able to find it. It feels around on the ground with those chemical sensors on the feet, finds it, and then the mouth parts and various things do the job. There are mechanisms that don't require vision. What I do know about the use of vision is that the lobster's eyes are pointed up, and they appear to be primarily, they are used uh, at least as an overhead predator detection system. You can take, we used to have the LSD, which is not something from the 1960s, that's the, the lobster scaring device. <laughs> it was this, uh, <laughs> it was this uh, wooden, black wooden plank that we would move over the tank with the lobster. And without habituation, you could get this orienting reaction from the animal where it would elevate its claws and orient its body upward towards that threat whenever the shadow passed over it. There are studies of that kind of thing. 
uh, but we don't know anything about the interaction of vision. I will say that the animals can do the task perfectly well without vision, and there's no difference between blindfolded and unblindfolded animals in terms of their observed performance in the trials that we've done. Yeah. One other do they feel Ah, yeah. Here we go. It's a philosophical question. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my, uh, my colleague, uh, Jennifer Basil, who also happens to be my wife, uh, she was on national radio. You're getting towards whether or not they feel pain, right? <laughs> and you boil them. And what she said, uh, blurted out on live radio in America, was people have to take responsibility for their carnivory. <laughs> right? uh, for me, the pain question is an important ethical one, right? We don't want our animals in the laboratory to suffer. Terribly important. I was just at a conference about um, standards for animal care in the EU in Naples where we were looking at cephalopods. The problem is establishing what, what pain is. And for me, I understand pain as specific neural pathways in the nervous system, right? There is an, a labeled line that if I cut in your spinal cord, you will not perceive pain. Right? I don't know that we have established those kinds of anatomical connections to the subjective experience. So I don't know whether or not they do or they don't. I'm, I'm agnostic about that. I can't assert it. Uh, animals show irritability. Lobsters show irritability. Uh, it's difficult to tell when you put a lobster in the pot whether it's showing pain responses or simply a stiffening of its chitin as a result of being in boiling water. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, this is a, a thing that Tony and I talked about. I, I am not going to say that we should torture our animals, but I am going to say that in order to avoid torturing the animals, we need to know what pain is and whether or not the animals have it for sure in order to avoid inflicting it. There may not be one thing that pain is. Exactly right. It might, it might be a language thing, as you a said. Absolutely. Oh, so you do think the lobster is irritated when it goes into the pan? No, I mean. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was using the general term irritability. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so you emphasize the issue of memory in solving this problem, which is very interesting. Um, but now, what, what's your, let's say, evidence from the lobster that, that that's going to be the case? Like, are these mushroom bodies actually involved? Because they will be then providing the memory, I assume, which is any physiology that supports this idea of Of these gaps, right, between the different observations. Yeah. Um, all we have is the behavioral evidence I mentioned from Moore, which suggests that the animals were becoming more efficient at tracking as they spent more time in the plume. Their speed increased, and that their steering angles became more accurate, and that the cues for that weren't present in the plume itself. Okay. That's all we have. Mm -hmm. uh, well, and then there's another thing. Um, I, did, I published this little paper about 1998 called Towards the Convergence, Robot and Lobster uh, Approaches, or something like that, where we used that backpack that I told you about from the lobster. Right? We recorded the chemical signals on the left and the right, and we cross-correlated that with the turning decisions that the animal mm -hmm. made. And then we could do the same thing with the robot. Except with the robot, we were using pure tropotaxis, so we knew what the rule looked like. So let me see if I can draw that basic result there. So if this is a positive delay and negative delay in the cross correlogram, um, and this is then zero, if we're looking at the cross correlation between the turning angle and the left-right difference, with the robot, I have to remember where the intersection is, I think we see something that looks like this, okay? A beautiful, pure, smooth curve, right? And that's exactly the rule. Steer to the side of the higher concentration with a little bit of sensory delay built in here, and I haven't drawn it perfectly. When I did the same thing with the lobster trials, and I have to think carefully about getting this correctly as well, we saw the same similar pattern, but we saw Hold on, I've got to think carefully. Now it's good also to take out the paper and to do the rest of the Yeah, but I'll, I'll, make the, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll make the point because I think yeah. it was very, I would like to do more of this kind of thing because this is a, a higher order, very good comparison. Um, I saw two, let's see, 
positive, negative. Yeah, right. So, okay. So it looked something like this. It was noisier. And there was the second bump right here. Okay. But when we were in the proximal jet, It was noisier, but it looked more like the lobster. So this suggested some kind of anticipation, right? The second bump that was here suggested that, that there was some delaying of the turning responses of two kinds. And I never got to dig into it well enough, deeply enough to actually explore it. But that's another piece of evidence that comes directly from that that suggests. And I might have my, in, I'm trying to be careful, I might have my axes reversed. This is orientation, my, right? This is the agreement between <coughs> the turning angle and the left-right discrepancy. Right. So there might also be some bias in the biomechanics of the whole system. That's like certain turning but, angles you don't like. Uh, no, because it's the agreement between the turning angle and the input signal. Ah, okay. Right? We'll have to stop. They'll probably okay. pull us difficult questions. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay, so thank you very much again, Frank. <laughs>